So hello and welcome to another episode of Top 10s. I'm your host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about 10 ridiculous plans by the world's wealthiest people, based on an original article by Ed Hatchett. Billionaires pride themselves on their bold new ideas, which is probably why people accept them. In the areas that actually matter, however, ideas have been scarce for a pretty long time. Mostly billionaires are self-serving children with the power to follow their dreams, however ludicrous they may be. Here are 10 of the stupidest plans the super rich are pursuing right now. Number 10, Munger Hall. In 2016, living dead billionaire Charles Munger made headlines for designing what he called a student mega dorm that architects have variously described as, and I quote, an experiment in human torture and a jail masquerading as a dormitory. Ah, oh, never change billionaires, never change. The 11 story building proposed for UC Santa Barbara and nicknamed Dormzilla is meant to house an incredible 4,500 students. But Munger, who proudly claimed to have never read a single book on architecture, thinks that it can hold many, many more. In his infinite wisdom, Munger decided against including windows in many of the bedrooms, so they may as well be underground. And instead of windows, they have artificial sunlight from screens, which as we all know is just as good for you, right? Who needs vitamin D? Especially not students who spend all the time indoors. He would tell reporters of his design that it was cutting edge, but one architect who resigned in protest from the college's design review committee called it, and I quote, unsupportable from the perspective of, and I quote further, a parent, and indeed, a human being. It is, he said, a social and psychological experiment. Munger doesn't deny it. In fact, he said the bedrooms aren't meant to be comfortable. They're meant to encourage students to spend more time together in the common areas. So it's hardly pandemic proof either. If Munger Hall were a city, it would be one of the most densely populated in the world. Just behind Dhaka in Bangladesh, per square mile, it would have 221,000 people. Like, doesn't that sound great? Let's think as well, as a former student myself, living in close proximity with 4,500 other students without windows just sounds like a recipe for everything to smell like farts. Like, students don't clean up after themselves on, like, the best of days. What is 4,500 students, like, mildewy towels in the same place without proper ventilation, sunlight, or um, air going to smell like after, let's say, I don't know, one weekend? I dread to think. What makes this billionaire's plan a little bit more sadistic than the average evil billionaire plan is that he bribed the college to accept it, offering a $200 million endowment on the condition they build Munger Hall. Why would he name this after himself? <laughs> Say, like, I'm going to build the modern equivalent of the Hunger Mines and I want my name on it. <sighs> to, to have the confidence of a billionaire who's never been told no, eh? When approached for comment, the university said that they were delighted with the building, as if with a gun to their head and totally ignoring reports from inhabitants of a similar dormitory, also designed by Munger for the University of Michigan in 2015, who said, in part, it was terrible. <laughs> with another adding, the lack of windows was depressing. There is no sense of time if you just sat in your bedroom with no natural light. They also mentioned that, of course, the bathrooms were moldy and damp. Sounds like a winner to me. Number nine, seasteading. Years before he funded Donald Trump's run for office, Peter Thiel, whose concept of libertarianism apparently puts a despot in charge, invested his money in seasteading, a deceptively quaint sounding term for a man-made tax haven at sea. Because apparently there's no laws at sea, did you know? In 2008, he put $1.7 million in seed capital for the Seasteading Institute, a board of billionaire fanaticists frustrated by taxes. You know, the things that pay for pretty much everything that we rely on to live. Cool. It took him almost a decade to realise his folly. In 2017, he told the New York Times, who, like the rest of us presumably already know, that we don't have the means to build cities at sea hundreds of miles from the shore. At least not without spending all of his money. But the Institute continues without him. Instead of bankrupting themselves to evade all human governments, they'll erect their monstrous platform-based water world cities in French Polynesia instead. Of course, this means they'll have to submit to its laws, whether they like it or not, but laws affecting businesses and trade, i.e. taxes, they'll be exempt from those, having pressured the government to create special economic zones just for them. Ah. So that's the thing, like, like, you pay taxes on near enough everything, like you buy a like, you know, a can of Coke, you pay taxes on it, you pay sales tax, what have you. In the UK, you'll pay VAT. And there's billionaires like, but I don't want to. And you almost have to respect, like, billionaires when their reasoning is, I just don't want to. <sighs> it's still a long way off, though, for now. The billionaires remain landlocked while they figure out how to build on an island that won't dissolve within decades. Apparently, seawater poses a problem. Who'd have thunk it? Number eight. 
XAI. In July 2023, Elon Musk announced on Twitter the formation of his new company, XAI, saying that the purpose was, and I quote, to understand reality. Like most billionaires and transhumanists, Musk needs all the help he can get, and the researchers he recruited to the endeavor were drawn from other top companies in the AI field, such as DeepMind, Google, and the aptly named OpenAI. Co-founder Greg Yang, whose past employers include Apple, Google, and Microsoft, hopes XAI will take artificial intelligence to, and I quote, the next level by developing the theory of everything for large neural networks. Whatever that means. Beyond that, details are scarce. According to the website, the goal of AI is to understand the true nature of the universe, which Musk later rephrased as, what the hell is really going on? But there's no explanation as to why he thinks computers can tell him. As the late great Douglas Adams stated many decades ago, we're unlikely to understand the answer anyway, so it may as well just be 42. Investors in his other company, Tesla, apparently want little to do with XAI. Musk has made a point of saying that while XAI plans to use Tesla's silicone computer chips and possibly some software, any relationship with Tesla has to be an arm's length transaction. Why, why am I doing air quotes? Like I'm going to do a Dodon Ray. An arm's length transaction. <laughs> I don't know why I was just doing that. It's like just, oh man, I'm watching too much Dragon Ball. <laughs> Tesla has a different investor base, which is corporate talk for even my investors think this is stupid. Number seven, stealing Patagonia. British billionaire Joe Lewis made his fortune speculating against the British pound and Mexican peso in the 90s. He used this to buy up more than 10,000 hectares of Patagonia, including Lake Escondido, which, breaking Argentinian law, stating all bodies of water are public, he still keeps off-limit to native Argentinians, which is apparently just a thing you can do when you can flash the cash to make it happen. So far, the government has failed to liquidate his locally registered shell company, Hidden Lake SA, which was set up solely to get around the law banning foreigners from buying certain land. It offers no goods or services whatsoever. Meanwhile, Lewis's armed thugs continue to block native Argentinians from access to the lake, which, by law, they should be allowed to go and visit and enjoy, because it's, it's their lake, effectively enforcing the borders of Lewis's parallel state. He's also bribed officials in the press to keep his paradise private, but not us, apparently, so we can talk about it, so eat a d Joe Lewis. Needless to say, what makes the plan stupid is Lewis's belief, typical of billionaires, that legal loopholes and paid-for politicians can protect him from ordinary Argentinians. They regularly march onto his land, often provoking violent confrontation, so it's a battleground waiting to happen. The almost 90-year-old has also naively failed to cover his back against countries he screwed over in the past. At the time the original article this video is based on, he faces jail in New York for insider trading and, pending sentencing, is not allowed to travel abroad. 6. Titanic. They never made Titanic 2. Really? Australian's Donald Trump, the shamelessly self-promoting real estate and mining billionaire Clive Palmer, is an oddity among his class. Instead of fixating on our techno-industrial future, he's far more fixated on the past. In recent years, he's resurrected dinosaurs. Oh man, Jurassic Park's real and a billion... Well, I guess in the original Jurassic Park novel and the film, it is a billionaire, but at least he looks like your granddad. Hello. So it's kind of cool. So he resurrected dinosaurs in the world's largest animatronic dino safari park. Oh, which burned down in 2015, so that's all good then. Thought about bringing back commercial airship flights, think the Hindenburg, and presumably the picture that's going to pop up somewhere on screen is the Hindenburg like midway through exploding, which is the enduring image of airship travel, but it's worth noting as a little extra bonus fact that a surprising amount of people survived the Hindenburg. I think over 50% of the people on board survived, uh, most of whom just jumped out before it exploded, if you can believe it. Maybe there'll be a, an article about that one day one of our lovely writers will create, and I will narrate. Moving swiftly on, uh, he also plans to build a life-size replica of the Titanic. His company, Blue Star Line, plans to make only one minor change to the original, adding a few meters width for additional stability, because we all know it's the stability that sunk the Titanic, not that, you know, bloody great iceberg. But otherwise, the ship will be exactly the same. Titanic 2, as it's presumably going to be called, will be exactly as long as the original. It'll have the same three passenger classes, because of course, restaurant facilities and decor. It will stop at the same ports, it might even hit the same iceberg. Fingers crossed if icebergs still exist. Of course, Palmer isn't the first to think of this plan. It's already been shelved many, many times before. Not least because an exact replica of the Edwardian Ocean Liner wouldn't pass modern safety regulations. The ship's interior would need a redesign for safety, think new stairways, doors, cabin arrangements, stuff like that. And it would be irresponsible to not use modern shipping technologies. Obviously, coal power would also be an issue. Basically, it wouldn't be the same, so why, why bother? Even as an exact replica, it would lack the original spirit. Despite its name, Titanic 2, or Gigantic, 
As an earlier plan called, it will be dwarfed by its modern equivalents. It's not the biggest ship ever built anymore. Neither is crossing the Atlantic the adventure that it was before air travel. As one critic sagely pointed out, to be the latest in transportation, the new ship would need to be a rocket. And given, like, you know, the track record of billionaires building rockets that, like, you know, don't explode, I wouldn't count on that one. Number five, the line. So since it was announced in 2021, Neo, the Saudi Arabian city of the future, which just sounds really fun to say. It's like, it sounds fast, doesn't it? Nyong, if that's how it's pronounced anyway. It's drawn criticism from experts worldwide, especially for the so-called line at its core. Calling to mind other megastructure vanity projects like Tokyo's proposed Shimuzu Mega City Pyramid, the line remains laughably impractical, if not outright impossible. Although the psychopathic narcissistic crown prince, Bin Salman, is proud of his involvement in the project, it was actually his contribution that made it so unworkable. Namely, he took someone else's idea of a city as a strip 2,000 meters wide and narrowed it down to a decidedly more conservative 200. So you can, in his own words, feel it. And feel it people would. One of the main criticisms leveled at the line is its basic unlivability. But construction of the line is underway regardless. As of last year, there's a 200 meter wide trench slicing through the pristine northwest of the otherwise oil ravaged nation. Apparently, livability isn't concerned before commencing work at the site, as the Prince's thugs evicted locals and sentenced them to death. As the old adage goes, you are infinitely closer to a homeless person than a billionaire. Number four, Asgardia. In 2022, Azerbaijani billionaire Igor Ashabayl was re-elected to the head of Asgardia, the world's first space nation. His inauguration, which took place in a virtual rendering of Asgardia's national arc, was live streamed on his website for Asgardians worldwide. For now, the space nation remains here on Earth. In other words, it doesn't really exist. All it has in space is a Rubik's Cube sized mini satellite in low Earth orbit. However, the dream is to build the Ark. Billionaires are not creative, so why would they not call it the Ark? So to get that in orbit and facilitate the first childbirth in space is their ultimate mission. But after this, um, Igor and his fellow Asgardians, who number more than a million here on Earth, hope to grant citizenship and space residency to 2% of Earth's population and become one of the 12 strongest economies. Good luck with that. You may not have heard of it, but Asgardia was founded in 2016 and has some pretty serious people on board, including renowned Hong Kong space law professor Yun Zhao, Asgardia's Supreme Justice, British Member of Parliament Lembic Opik, um, Asgardia's Chairman of Parliament, and European Space Agency veteran Lana Del Wynne, Asgardia's Prime Minister. Unfortunately, despite its utopian vision, Asgardia's constitution reads more like a blueprint for a dystopia. Even the freedom of speech is strictly conditional on upholding the so-called supreme values, which doesn't give me bad vibes at all as a fan of sci-fi. Uh, the national security keeping secrets and individuals honor. The scientocracy, which frowns upon all unenlightened thinking, plans to regulate the flow of information to its people, conduct parliamentary sessions in secret from citizens, and give sweeping despotic powers to Ashabayo himself. If that floats your boat, or ark, see what we did there, it is unsurprisingly easy to hop aboard by registering your interest online. Number three, the metaverse. Ooh, it's gonna be a good one. There's few things in like, you know, recent memory that have crashed and burned as hard as like NFTs in the metaverse. And it is so, so satisfying as an online content creator who spent the better part of six months during like, you know, the hype of NFTs being told by people with like pixelated ape avatars on Twitter that I was going to lose my job. How's that going? Although it's still not clear what the plan is, Mark Zuckerberg is not done with the metaverse, despite claims of its abandonment, which are admittedly very funny. His specially renamed umbrella company Meta continues to work on the frustratingly vague idea. Even employees are reportedly sick of Zuckerberg's airy-fairy, whim-driven approach. As Wired observed in 2023, substituting the word metaverse for cyberspace in literally everything he says about his plan makes no difference to the meaning whatsoever, because there isn't much meaning to begin with. In essence, the metaverse is a virtual reality hellscape through which Zuckerberg hopes to extract even more of your data and money. Like the internet, it will be accessed through a range of devices, and also like the internet, at its worst at least, it'll track you from one to another. This is really the point, it's the Facebookification of the internet. No more hiding, not if this kind of thing appeals to you anyway. Of course, that's a fairly bog standard blueprint for any tech startup, so what does Meta's Metaverse actually offer? Is it, as Zuckerberg's many video ads imply, the ability to visit your friends in the real world as a cool hologram? No, because that technology does not exist. Is it, as he has otherwise claimed, the ability to do almost anything you can imagine? Nope, because unless all you can imagine is virtual reality with screen straps to your eyes, um, it's basically second life. Pretty much just with the extra bullying, because remember, it's owned by Facebook. If Facebook and Meta's flagship VR platform Horizon or anything to go by, which of course 
it stands the reason that they are, as it stands, all the metaverse really is is a placeholder for an actual idea. Kafibi! Huh? Pramu? Oh, show me a go! Huh? <laughs> Number two, Calico Labs. Calico Labs? Calico? I've always pronounced it like Calico Cats. Some people might pronounce it Calico. I'll pronounce it both ways to annoy everybody, and then we're all unhappy. Billionaires are well into life extension. This is nothing new. What is new, though, is their confidence in solving the problem of death, just like they solve the problem of taxes, which admittedly they've gotten really, really good at avoiding. Uh, they say the only two things in life that are unavoidable are death and taxes, and billionaires already avoid 50% of that statement. So, you know, their confidence in avoiding death is not unfounded. So announced in 2013, Larry Page's Calico Labs, founded with money from Google, is the top company seeking a cure. The idea, Page said at the time of its launch, is not just to make the world a little better, but a lot better. So that's the thing, who doesn't trust Google, a company that very infamously um, quietly dropped their long-standing company motto of don't be evil for no particular reason. What's questionable though is whether extending the lifespan of the world's most dangerous species would make the world better at all. There are many problems with life extension, ethical, ecological, social, economic, and so forth. The most obvious though is access. Larry Page and others already behave like modern day pharaohs or living gods, enslaving the planet to bolster their power. How much further removed from the average human would they be, though, if they were immortal? And how likely would they be to share that immortality given their hoarding of wealth? Even assuming they were philanthropic, is immortality something you'd want? Think about it. Like, wouldn't it be like staying awake without ever going to sleep or staying asleep without ever waking up? You know, and let us know in the comments about your thoughts about whether you'd want to be immortal, because my personal philosophy towards it is, is living forever is akin to hell. Because statistically, the longer you live, the chances of like something horrific happening to you approach one, and I don't want that. Really though, whether it's for the few or for the many, human immortality would mean total control by the state. At the very least, reproduction would no longer be free. So, you know, one of the most fun things you can do would not be allowed and be illegal. Other basic freedoms, such as like thought, minority report style, would also be surveilled and restricted. Why, you, you ask yourselves? Well, because an immortal Larry Page and his fellow death-fearing technocrats will become so paranoid about preserving their thousand-year-plus lifespans from accidental or deliberate termination that every possible risk, including you, would have to be countered, vetted, and strictly surveilled. And again, if you find, why would that happen? Like, the, the longer you live, like the chance of something bad happens to you approaches one, and billionaires would do everything in their power to avoid that happening. And finally, number one, the 2045 initiative. So we've talked about the 2045 initiative before. It's basically plan B for life extension, transferring human consciousness to artificial bodies. Oh yeah, it's time. Uh, what, what dystopian future do you guys want? Minority Report or iRobot? Pick your poison. Since we first covered it, however, five years ago, very little progress has been made. Uh, for such a near-term goal, 22 years left now, apparently, this lack of progress is, it's pretty lightly, terminal. The brainchild of Russian billionaire Dmitry Itikov, uh, the initiative's original plan was to upload human consciousness to the cloud, network, virtual reality, or the metaverse, as some like to call it. Later, the focus changed to life in this world. However, the second of Istikov's four projected milestones to transplant the human brain to a robotic body at the end of its natural life is meant to be reached by 2025, so two years from the time this video was recorded. The media tycoon hasn't even reached his first milestone yet, deadline for 2020, to successfully control a robotic replica of a human body via brain-computer interface, also known as BCI. Although BCI technology is currently being worked on, though notably not by Isdikov, it's nowhere near that level at present. The third milestone is transferring consciousness from human brains to artificial substitutes sometime in roughly the next 12 years. This is basically the goal, but there is one further step Istikov hopes to achieve, the fourth milestone, hologram-like avatars or bodies of light by 2045. Uh, transhumanists like Istikov point to the exponential development of technology to justify their, let's put it kindly, ambitious timeframes. He likes to evoke Moore's law when discussing this, which for anyone unfamiliar, states like in part that the power of computers doubles every year and a half. In other words, it's a faith-based worldview, and it's one that's based on just a fundamental fallacy as any other new religious movement. The totally unfounded conviction that consciousness comes from the brain, 
from matter as opposed to the other way around, as philosophers have told us for millennia and even physicists have now come to realise. The 2045 initiative isn't completely detached from reality though. What we are likely to see within the next two decades is a cult-like trend of unnecessary medical procedures whereby companies rake in billions substituting healthy human body parts for cybernetic hands, legs, eyes and so on. You know, Cyberpunk 2077 style and they couldn't even get that running as a video game so I don't trust them to get it running when it's inside my body. And as they say, this is what happens when the kids are left in charge. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. I certainly enjoyed recording it. So much so, I actually recorded it twice because uh, we messed up the audio the first time I did this. I hope it's fine now. I'm just going to give the folks at home a, a, little, a little tip. If you see me wearing my shirt unbuttoned, that means it's the second time I recorded the video because I'm recording it on my day off. But otherwise, I did hope you enjoyed the video. As noted, it was written by one Ed Hatchet, and if they have provided social media links for us to share, they will be linked below. You can also find my social media links as well as links to my other channels, Fact Theme with Carl Smallwood and Wiki Weekends, which are, have an altogether more casual vibe than Top Tens and its sister channels, Biographics and Geographics, which I'm also the interim host of. Can you tell I've done this spiel 10 times this week. Otherwise, I hope you found the topic of this video interesting and that it inspires some lively discussion down in the comments. And while you're down there, why not leave a like and subscribe to the channel so you can see more videos like this.